Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Well, hello, Knife Junkies, and welcome to episode number 146 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. As you know by now, it is the place for knife newbies and knife junkies to learn all about knives and knife collecting and hear from the knife makers, the knife manufacturers, the designers, the knife reviewers, anybody that loves knives. That's what we're all about on the Knife Junkie Podcast. And Bob, we've got a uh, another interview. Today is uh, Sunday. It's our interview show. Who you have the uh, pleasure and privilege to speak with today. Well, today is proof positive that it's not who you know, but it's who you know, who they know. <laughs> and tonight, <laughs> okay. uh, we're, talk uh, we're talking to Alex Steingraber, and he's a knife maker who's doing really interesting things uh, that, that came to me through some of the friends of this show. Alex and Timothy and a couple of others have mentioned him, and so I started tuning into him on Instagram and then recently on YouTube, and um, well... This guy's making uh, handmade knives. He's a steel antagonist and connoisseur. He knows what he's talking about with steel and has some real opinions. So I'm excited to talk to him. All right. Well, let's get into that interview. What do you say? Let's do it. Ever strop a knife again, even though it gets no real use? Face up to what you are. You're a knife junkie. Alex, how you doing? Alex Steingraber of Steingraber Performance Knives. Thanks for coming on the show, sir. <laughs> Hey, it's a pleasure to be here. So uh, when you're in the green room, I described you as a handmade knife maker and a steel antagonist as well as connoisseur. You seem to have a, uh, a thing with steel, and I want to get into it uh, with you. A uh, thing maybe beyond what some knife makers have, but before we get there, you're up in uh, New York, right? Yeah, I'm in uh, upstate New York, uh, central New York area, Rochester. Okay, Rochester. We have a couple friends up there. Slacy Dicey's there. I went to uh, school in upstate New York, and 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 I lived in the city for a little while. Um, what's it like being in New York State and making knives? Honestly, um, it's it's actually quite the mecca, if you will. Um, we have two great steel companies. I mean, Bowler and Crucible, and Crucible is about two hours away from where I live. And Niagara Specialty Metals, which is the, is the mill for Crucible, is about an hour and 30 minutes away from my house. So I'm super close to where everyone in the world gets their steel from as far as Crucible is concerned. So it's, it's pretty great. <laughs> Wow, you know what? I was I was fishing for something totally different. I was thinking New York State. I was thinking of New York City. You know, oh, it's very prohibitive, and you got to be sneaking around. But you're right. Yeah, all of those all of those resources right there. So, so uh, you know, I know you um, as a regrinder initially, mm -hmm. and yep. uh, and now you're making your own knives. But before we get into your own knives, I want to talk about your regrinding. Tell me about your philosophy behind that, and and you know what you're what you're looking to do with that so that was actually a funny story um i never knew what a regrind was until somebody kind of like sprung it on me one of my buddies from reddit and he was like hey why don't you regrind one of my knives and i was like what the hell is a regrind and then i did some research and i was like oh that makes sense yeah because like geometry and all that stuff so he sent me one of his knives i reground it on this like little shitty machine that i had um at the time and i mean it turned out well and he loves it but then from then on i was just like i guess i'll offer the service people you know do it but i'll offer it at like a discount um to people who can't afford it so so were you were you unaware of the what wait first of all were you a knife collector knife guy at that time i mean were you aware of the regrind thing I was aware of the regrind thing. I just wasn't sure of how to obtain one because there was, you know, Josh from uh, REK and then um, what's, I forget how to pronounce that guy's name, but Tom Kieran. Tom Crine. Yeah. Crine. Crine. Crine yeah. 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 So he did a bunch of knives and then those are the only two people I knew about. And then um, I, I was like still making knives, just not with, you know, higher end steels at the time. And I was into knives like all my life. So 
um, I had some, you know, fascination with it, but didn't really, you know, it didn't really catch hold until my buddy was like, you shouldn't do this and, and try it. So what were the, what were the um, problems people are trying to solve? Okay. I've had, a, I've had, I've had one regrind done and uh, it solved my problem. I'm curious what uh, people come to you with. So there's a lot of people who get, you know, a lot of production knives reground because they just can't obtain that type of performance. And when I say performance, I just mean thinner edge geometry can equal, you know, higher wear resistance on all steels, basically. Um, I don't think, I think a lot of people know that fact, but then a lot of people are just like, I want to regrind because everyone else has a regrind and I'm not sure why. And then they use it and they're like, wow this is super slicey and I can maintain it. Like it's super easy to maintain. So a lot of people come to me with like, um, hinderers and, you know, thicker <laughs> stock blades that aren't, I mean, they're not really designed to be a slicing knife. They're designed to be like more of a, you know, tactical or performance as far as like hard use, if you will. Mm -hmm. So action knives, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like an action knife. Um, so anything like, a, like an Emerson or anything like that, spider codes, all that stuff. So once those are done, I kind of explain like, hey, like you can't go around just like smashing this on, you know, tree limbs and stuff. But yeah. if you use your knife like a knife, you'll be able to um, enjoy it. Yeah, uh, that's that's interesting. My uh, the one regrind I had done was a uh, was a hinderer because everything about this XM18. Uh, I loved, except for the the blade grind, and I'm not a you know I'm not a super hardcore user, so I didn't know I I knew that regrinding it wasn't gonna like rob me of any performance when I'm out doing hardcore things, uh, which I don't do. So uh, uh, it was definitely a benefit uh, there. But uh, so in terms of your own collecting and your knives, you know you have a YouTube channel and you look at knives, mm -hmm. you look at steels, and you do cut tests and such. What what do you look for in a knife that you would want to buy and keep for yourself? Um, just like I'm not super into into design. Um, I'm into design as a vehicle to transport steel, I guess. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. but as as far as like you know, Alex, he's like super into design and the art of it, and I respect that. And I respect all the guys that are into that, but it's just not for me. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm mostly into, you know, knives that have weird steels in them or have insanely thin geometries from like custom makers. Like I have a Phil Wilson custom. Mm -hmm. It's super thin and like, it's just stupid to cut with. It's like not even fair. It's like, I have a lightsaber in my hand right now. Right. And it slips it's between the atoms. Oh man, it's yeah, it's awesome. And um, so, like, as far as, like, as high end as I'll go is, like, I have, like, a Strider, the uh, Monkey's Edge knife. And mm -hmm. I wanted this one because it's in 3V. And, like, it's a weird one-off steel that not many companies use. On so, folders. Right. Yeah. So, it's just, it's mainly a weird steel fetish, if you will. <laughs> I don't know. Well, no, no, I get that. I mean, you get into the minutia of any kind of uh, area of interest. Obviously, for you, it's not just an area of interest. It's part of your income. And so, so I, I want to ask you about steels. Uh, you seem to have a, a, a um, greater than usual interest in and knowledge of steels. Uh, how, how does that factor into your knife making? And, and where did that interest, uh, that particular interest come from? So to start out, the, the interest came from like just me making knives. Um, when I first started out, it was just with old buzzsaw blades that I'd find around, you know, garage sales and stuff. And then um, I made a few, you know, really good knives out of them. And then I figured um, I was going to not make knives anymore. I don't know why. And my buddy was like, hey, Wait, when, you make when, was, when was that? How old were you when you I mean, like, when did this start and when did you stop before uh, you started? Again? Like four years ago. Okay. Uh, um, and then I was like, I'm just going to not do it. It's a huge investment and I'm probably not even, not even any good. So my buddy was like, you should just make me a knife in Bowler K390. And I was like, what? That's like one of the most high wear resistant steels that I know of. So I was like, you know what? 
F it, I'll do it. So I bought some steel, made the knife, ground it. I think I ground that one about 15 thousandths behind the edge. And it looked like this. Oop. It looked like this. It didn't look mm -hmm. like my normal design. So it looked like an actual shark. So you got like this and you got the belly and like the little fin here with the choil and all that. So I picked that design because I'm terrified of sharks. Yeah. Um, and Good thing to be terrified of. Yeah. Exactly. So that design actually took like four or five iterations to do out of, I made it out of wood first. Once I liked it, I made the knife, sent everything out to Peter's to get heat treated. I asked, I asked, asked for a very high HRC, so 65 to 66 HRC, and got it back, you know, ground it thin, threw tarot tough handles on it, and called it a day. Um, and then my buddy was like, wow, this thing's amazing. You should make more. And I was like, okay, I guess I'll make more. And so I... Uh, I think I have the other design up here. Yep, hang on. Mm -hmm. So I have another design that I made called the Bull Shark. It was just a smaller iteration of that, and then it had this this part kind of like curved. Right. So I made a set of those in L Max. Same thing, high hardness. I sold those. The dude that got them was like, "These are amazing. You should make more." So instead, so then I went back to the drawing board and I kind of. I blended both designs together and that's what this is. Mm -hmm. So it's just on top of the other one. It's just, you have all of this material taken out mm -hmm. and then I added the holes for more weight reduction and to further it. I, uh, now I get everything laser cut and it looks like this. So I have, you know, the choil, the little fin here that kind of sticks out still and just the, overall shape and you get a full purchase on this. So you're not hanging off the edge. Right. Um, and I have pretty, you know, sausagey hands. So <laughs> man. Okay. So this, this, this is funny because I've spoken to a lot of knife makers and many of them, I mean, right offhand, I'm thinking of uh, Lightfoot, and I'm thinking of Demco and, and their love of sharks and, and how it comes into their design in one way or another. And uh, I am a knife junkie and I have a love of sharks lifelong. Actually just saw one jumping out of the water in North Carolina a week ago. <laughs> it was interesting. Uh, nothing I've ever seen like that before. Um, so it's kind of it's kind of cool to hear you talk about your inspiration, sharks also. But you're saying that you came back into the game after being out of it for four years and you're and you're grinding a knife that's 15 thousandths behind the edge. Um, that seems like uh, that seems like you might have a natural facility if you're able to do that right out of the gate after after not having to do that for a while. I mean, because to, to to grind steel that thin is not an easy thing, is what I'm getting at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the whole time, like, so like I would grind the knives that I did make pretty thin. I don't have an old design lying around, but um, I still ground those pretty thin. And it, but it was mostly like sort of like a half plunge, like the plunge went up halfway up the blade. These are all full flat grinds. So like, um, they're a little bit easier in my book, but, um, yeah, I mean the first batch, like, yeah, it was a little crooked, but once I got everything down, so I would mark. So what I do currently is I, you know, I mark a center line here mm -hmm. and then I, I mark a line here. So now I have my X and my Y and I know where to stay within that. And it kind of helps you. And if you can, um, so I have a file guide that I throw on there too. I don't use a jig or anything. I still, you know, semi freehand with training wheels, so to speak. So now it's easier because I've done so many knives. But back then, yeah, it was really, really difficult to do. But um, I only did two knives. So it was, mm -hmm. you know. So what's the difference between a file guide and a jig? So a jig um, would be like... Uh, so a jig would be like this piece of like angle iron. Mm -hmm. You put a bolt in here. This is threaded. You put a bolt in here and you can adjust the angle that way on your platen or on your tool rest rather. Mm -hmm. And then you clamp your knife right here and you would just grind. So you can maintain a consistent angle while you're putting the main bevel on basically, right? Yep. 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 Pretty much. And there's a lot of makers that do that and there's no shame in that. I mean, no, no, no. I would all, do it that. all comes down to the, yeah. Why the hell not? I, 
the reason why I don't do it is just like it's I'm not used to it and I need that tactile feedback on my hands. So that's why I draw lines mostly just to kind of stay in the lines. It's like coloring almost, but with a, you know, highly abrasive belt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So wait, wait, uh, now what's the file guide? How does so that the file differ- guide? So the file guide just kind of uh, slides right. Like basically you just uh, slide the knife in. Let me get this on here. And then you can just set your, your angle. It has a carbide mm-hmm. face, so it's not going to wear out. So it and stops then, you from going too far on the plunger. Yep, pretty that, much. And this was designed by Bill Banky, the uh, Forge and Fire winner of season six, I believe. Uh, I know, I know him. I just don't know him because I've watched them yeah. all. But okay, so, <laughs> so four years after you kind of stop your initial, and and now I relate to this because uh, I went to art school and I've I've been an artist all my life, kind of doing creative things here or there, no matter what they are. But I go through fits and starts and it's always a parabola and sometimes I'm riding high on it and I'm doing great. And then sometimes I dip out of an interest. And so when you said that you were making knives for a while and then you stopped and then you got back into it and you're like, wait a second. And it resonated for you. So what, what was it that really made it resonate the second time around? So the second time around, it was like, um, I wasn't going to do it. And it was mostly my buddy just like, you know, you should make, a knife out of this higher end steel. And I was like, okay, I'll try it. And then after I did it in the reception I got, it was like, all right, if I'm going to do this, I need to do it right. And I need to do research and I need to just invest all of my, all of my creativity into just, you know, learning about steel and making a knife um, with thin geometry. Um, Because we can make knives. You see people make knives all the time. Um, but there is a design to be had with like, or rather an element to be had with design that, you know, fits everything. So like, for instance, with the shark, it's slightly curved. So now we've, we've taken a longer knife and we've, we've made it shorter because we curved it Mm -hmm. like a bow. And then as far as the grip, I'm, I'm more of like a, a handle, you know, leave more handle on there for me because I want to be able to hold onto the knife. You get a lot of knives and you're doing this all day and it's like, that's uncomfortable. So, and then also with the blade, you can get, you know, more cutting edge if you just, you do a trailing edge on it or if you did like a re- recurve or something like that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I looked at, you know, different designs and then kind of drew everything out and just settled on this design. And I was like, oh, it looks like a shark. So, Let's call it the shark. And, um, and then, you know, just took off from there and, and just researched and watched YouTube videos and, you know, talked to guys in the community that were into steel and just did my own testing, did my own sharpening, all that stuff. Like I was never a sharpener initially. And then after getting into steel, I was like, I need to sharpen every single steel. I need to know what it feels like. So do you, do you feel like you can identify a steel if we blindfolded you and gave you five different <laughs> knives to sharpen? Do you think you could tell what was at least in a range? Maybe, maybe, but I don't think so. <laughs> um, there's probably sharpeners out there way better than I am that could definitely do that. But I mean, that would be a fun activity. <laughs> <laughs> that would be. Oh, yeah? You think you know steels? Here, what's this? <laughs> so, you, so you said you started looking at like uh, YouTube videos and kind of like boning up that mm-hmm. way. Um, uh, what, what kind of, so were those your mentors, people making knives on YouTube, people talking about steels on YouTube? Yeah. I mean, pretty much. Cause like, I don't, I'm not really like in, in the community. I don't go to like shows or, you know, trade shows or stuff like that yet. Yeah. But yeah. I just wanted to be able to reach out and like figure out what the hell's going on and like, where is the direction of the knife world, go- world going? And I mean, there's a divide and it's not a bad divide. It's just like, there's, there's steel junkies and then there's like design junkies and I respect mm. both sides <laughs> and I want to be somewhere like right in the middle, but closer to the steel junkie side and mm. kind of give that performance to people. But yeah, I mean, as far as, you know, YouTube videos and, and all of that, just like reading and, and like talking with people and talking with people that use knives too. And just say like, what do you want? And, 
and that sort of thing. So that's funny that that your binary is steel nerds versus design nerds, and and I come in around the tactical nerds versus the gentleman nerds. And believe me, I like it all. I mean, I I go mm -hmm. to I go to a Walmart and and I look at the Rapala fillet knives that I've seen since <laughs> I was a tiny kid. I still look at them like, ooh, nice knife. So I yeah. mean, a lot of the times it's just a love of knives, but then. Mm -hmm. Like like any other thing, you know, you start getting in the minutia, and uh, mm -hmm. so uh, you hold up your knife. You were you were just showing the shark, and you were talking about how the top arch kind of reduces the size ever so slightly, and then and it yep. also allows you a full hand grip, and then and then the uh, the sweep of the belly allows you a little bit more cutting edge. Okay, you're telling me all this stuff, and it's very utilitarian, but it it, mm -hmm. it actually turns into a quite a beautiful profile. How much do aesthetics uh, count to you or factor in when you're designing? I mean, I'm not gonna, cause like anyone can just take, you know, say for instance, this like this thing right here, I can throw a sharp edge on it and a handle, <laughs> drill a few holes in it. No, I got a knife. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not gonna be a very comfortable one. It's not gonna be able to stab anyone because it has this end right here, but I mean, it's still gonna, it's still gonna cut. So, I mean, with, with like aesthetics and stuff, yeah, I want it to be aesthetically pleasing to the eye. And I want to use, you know, certain materials that are aesthetically pleasing. Um, but also I want it to be able to, to perform the way I want and the way I think people want. So like this is one in uh, 4V that's finished. Mm -hmm. 4V. And I mean, it, it, CPM 4V. Yeah. And it has, um, you know, the finish on it's nice. It has... I don't do a hand rub. I'm not going to hand rub knives. Um, that's just too much time. But I mean, I have belts and abrasives that um, can cater to that same look. And I mean, we have a small, you know, that's knife that I can get a full purchase on. And I mean, you can do all of your grips that you want to do. And I mean, it has this nice yeah. handle profile in the back to kind of yeah, give yeah. like a hammer grip and you can, you can pinch grip it close. I put enough on the Ricasso edge to, so you're not uh -huh. digging into the blade and cutting. Yes. You're kind yes, of yes. pinch gripping here and doing stuff. So just little things like that, that, that were pleasing to me and other people are like, this is awesome. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, as far as the hand rub thing is concerned, you've got a beautiful gr uh, blade grind on there. I wouldn't want to see that rubbed out personally. Right. right. And uh, uh, it's funny. You mentioned the, the pinch grip, and how you left a little extra meat on the Ricasso for a pin script. And uh, I listened to your, uh, your podcast with Alex and Tom over at uh, Knife Talk. Uh, I mean, Sharp Talk, I'm sorry. And uh, you were talking about, I think you were talking about the AD20, the shark lock, and how you thought that might interfere. And, and, and when you're talking about that, I was, I was picturing how you were talking about how you do your knife, uh, how you do your blade testing. Uh, mm hmm the blade testing and the steel testing, where does that all come from? And, and what are you hoping to get out of that? So it all comes from just like all the guys that are in the community currently, like uh, Pete from Cedric and Ada, you know, mm -hmm. he's been in the game for a long time doing that testing. Super Steel Steve been doing the testing. Um, Tom Hosang, uh, Gerald Outpost 76. They've all been doing that testing. And I just, and I mean, one of one of the guys that I look up to is Phil Wilson, and he also did testing, but he did testing with with uh, Manila rope. Hmm. So he was able like to, hanging. you know, yeah, free hanging, and then like also cutting on top of like a scale. I don't use a scale to cut on top of. I just that part doesn't really interest me. But just the fact that I can cut through all of this Manila rope, and then you know that's how wear resistant I guess the knife is compared to cardboard. Manila rope is like really, really abrasive to cut through. Mm -hmm. um, and it does a lot of edge damage to a lot of knives. But if you have something that can hold that, that apex and cut through that and just maintain that, you're, you're going to be okay. <laughs> that's, like the, that's like the higher end of the harder use part. So if my, if my knife or any other knife that gets a regrind can, can withstand that, it's probably going to withstand through normal everyday use. All right, so let's talk about geometry for a second. You brought up you brought up geometry, and I feel like you know I've been collecting knives forever. I've been watching YouTube videos, you know, since nothing fancy came on the scene. And 
only in the last five years would I say I've been hearing about Thin Behind the Edge and actual performance, believe it or not. I mean, you know, performance mm-hmm. outside of the campsite, if you will. Right, and, right. Uh, so, so what are the kind of things that you look for? I mean, performance is in your name. What, what are your ultimate uh, benchmarks for this? So f- for this design and all the other designs going forward, it's just mainly, um, it's mainly geometry because geometry really does cut. Um, if you had, say for instance, something that was 20 thousandths behind the edge and something that's 10 thousandths behind the edge and they're both at the same degrees per side, Give examples. Sharpening. Give it. I'm sorry. Before you continue, because oh, okay. some of us might not be as, uh, um, all right. You so know, let's uh, knowledgeable this, about. Let's take this Strider for instance. This Strider mm-hmm. is about thirty thousandths behind the edge. Okay, it's at a. I want to say it's at a twenty-five degree per side. Last time I checked, so roughly fifty total. Mm-hmm. This, let's just say this. This was like one fifty-four cm. And this was also 154 cm. They were both at the same HRC. Now this is 10 thousandths behind the edge, and it has, eh, let's say it's the same, the same as this. It's it's roughly 15 or 50 overall. Mm-hmm. This is going to cut a lot longer than this will, and it's because of geometry. When you when you sharpen something at 15 degrees per side, you're actually thinning out the edge. That's what you're doing, and you're allowing you know, your knife to now abrade through material a lot easier. Whereas if you have this wedge, Hmm. you're not abrading through material as easy. And the thing that can help, help with that or helps that, uh, you know, or solidifies that rather is, is hardness. So if you have a harder knife, you're able to get a thinner edge and maintain that edge without longer, you know, yeah. Okay, so let me ask you this. That uh, I, I've had a number of knives that are quite thick behind the edge, hinderers, for instance, that are really mm-hmm. sharp and cut paper beautifully, mm-hmm. but still, you yeah. know, they're not going to move mm-hmm. through material as well. H- how is it that something can be razor sharp and yet not as high performance? It's just that, it's just that thickness. I mean, we can get, um, what's a good example of a knife? Take a tops knife, for instance. They're like, what, a quarter inch thick almost? Yeah. <laughs> you, those things are razor sharp. They're really yes. sharp. They can shave hair. But if I want to cut through cardboard, which is pretty, it's a fairly binding material, not as binding as like rope or something like that. Mm-hmm. If I want to cut through that, man, that's going to be a bitch to do because it's so thick. Now, if I take, well, what do I got here? Now, if I take this piece of like heat treat foil, look how thin that is. And if I were able to sharpen that microscopically to a razor blade, this is already really sharp. Right. right. I can cut, I could cut through anything because that if, and if this was at 65 HRC, I could definitely cut through anything. because It's going to hold that geometry. Okay. So with all that in mind now, uh, well, you have control over your knife maker. I, I was going to say, if you had, you know, everything you wanted, but you have, you could have whatever you want. What's the perfect knife steel? What's the perfect grind at, up for, for performance? Perfect knife steel, perfect grind for performance. Yeah. yeah. Um, Bowler K390 at about 10 to 8 thousandths behind the edge at about 66 HRC. That's 66. my yeah, that's my preference. Okay, so what, does, does that make it chippy? Is what I'm gonna ask you. That's such a high no. No. Okay. I uh I have some footage on my phone. Well, we're using my phone, but I'll have some videos coming out of uh steels that are at a higher hardness that um I've hammered through um oak and uh stuff like that. I actually uh did, I actually did a design called the Sasquatch. I don't have that in front of me. It's on my Instagram, but um, mm-hmm. it's called the Sasquatch. It's in CPM Rex 121, the most wear-resistant steel on the planet. <laughs> um, it's more of a novelty, but, I, but it's for the steel junkie. Um, it's at 70 HRC, 70, 71 Damn. HRC. <laughs> um, and I hammered it through a piece of uh, oak uh, dowel with a, ha- with a metal hammer. Wow. And um, as long as you don't twist it, you're good. 
If you twist that, it's going to snap that tip right off or snap whatever mm -hmm. area off because we're putting lateral stress on it. But if you don't, it can take, it can withstand those blows. Um, so I think if people sort of like just not do a little research, but like just, just try it out on just, you know, try it on a gas station knife or something like that mm -hmm. and just see what your results are. Um, you mean trying out that test on a gas station knife? Yeah, 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 yeah. Just try it out and see what your results are. I mean, there's videos online of people taking Maximit at 68 HRC and smashing it through a railroad tie and no damage at all. Wow. And I think that whatever happened in the knife community, someone said that that happened or they saw some anecdotal evidence of somebody's blade snapping. Because we all saw that S110V, you know, Spyderco blade snap all the time. And it's, yeah, they snap because you snapped it. Yeah, this it is an outrage. Me. Yeah, it didn't snap because you, you, you know, you hit it on something or anything like that, um, impactly or whatever. I think that um, if people just do little tests like that on their own, I mean, granted, if you break your knife, it's not my fault. But just, you know, tap it through something. Try to, you know, figure it out. And if you have a thinner geometry, it's going to be able to go through it. And that hardness is going to hold that. So the, K, the K390, there aren't too many people who use that, especially in the knives we all carry. I know Spyderco does with the police four or five. What is it? Four? Police what are they four. And then they did the, uh, the PM2 and the pair three. Okay. So what is it about K390 that, that you like in particular? So in, the, in researching steel, I also researched the actual use for it because all these steels are not used for knives other than like, you know, 154CM and S30V and all those. So this knife steel or this steel rather is used on boring shafts of giant mining machines oh, that dig cool. giant holes in the earth. That's awesome. So now you make a knife out of it and now you have a sweet story to tell people that like, you know what this, like, that's how much of a nerd I am. I'm like, this steel is literally designed. Do you know what this should be doing instead yes. of riding in my pocket? <laughs> exactly. This can bore through rocks and stuff like that. And it helps maintain, you know, the shaft on those, on those bits. And now it's in my pocket as a knife and it can cut through anything. <laughs> so yeah. it's, it's just really exciting when you when you get down to what their actual what the actual design is on things. So you mentioned Pete from Cedric and Ada, and I know that his uh, his uh, police his Spyderco police four is one of his uh, you know favorite knives. He's done a lot of videos on that K three ninety there. Spyderco, I know I know from uh, the interview I heard with you that you love Spyderco. Um, is it because that they're they're always kind of experimenting with new steel? We have S forty five VN and uh, yeah. Spy twenty seven and all this. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I mean they they don't get super fancy with their designs, but um, they do get super fancy with the steels that they introduce to people. And they're like, you know what? I think everyone wants to have LC two hundred N, the most you know corrosion resistant steel on the planet, other than Vanax. Um, but just things like that, like here's K390 in a knife blade or, you know, here's Maximit in a knife blade. Like we don't need Maximit in a knife blade. Everyone can just take a Barlow out of their pocket and field dress a deer. That's all we need. We, we only need 1095. We don't need yeah. all the steel. <laughs> yeah. But we have it and we live in this, time, this weird time where people are getting pissed that 63 HRC isn't hard enough. And it's – there's people like Sean of uh, – uh, <laughs> triple B handmade that that was one of his quotes. He's just like, dude, you're getting mad at 63 HRC steel. Like you should be happy. And, and I'm grateful that spider Coast, yeah. you know, doing, doing this kind of stuff. Um, there's some steels that I would question that they are running a little bit softer, but it's not their fault. They're doing things in giant batches. I mean, it's, right. it's bound to happen. It's funny. Cause like uh, the, the higher HRC, the harder the steels can get, the softer people get, and they demand the harder steels. Yep. Like, I definitely right. need 65 HRC or I can't do my work. <laughs> yeah, right. You have a video yeah. called 1095. That's right. Your grandpa used it or something like that. And yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Yep. I love that because I love 1095. I love the patina. Mm -hmm. For me, a lot of it is aesthetic. I'm a very shallow guy it, when it comes oh, yeah. to knives. Uh, you know, I like the way things look and the way they, you know, age. And so I love 1095. 
I also like how easily it sharpens. Uh, what what yeah, do you think absolutely. of some of these, uh, some of the older 440C, 1095? I mean, you're talking about K390, the, the <sighs> ultimate steel here. What about these older steels? Absolutely. That your grandpa have, used. <laughs> we wouldn't have anything that we have today if it weren't for those. Um, do you have a minute? Because we can talk yeah. about this for a second. <laughs> yeah, let's hear um, it. So I live in Rochester, New York, and there's a, there's a knife company that was founded here called Robeson Cutlery Company. And uh, they pretty much, all the designs you see with traditionals and stuff were either started by Case or Robeson. <laughs> and Robeson had over 100 designs as far as, you know, traditional knives. They used 1095 for a lot of things, and then they started using stainless uh, when, the, when the owner died and Emerson Case, from Case Knives took over. Mm -hmm. And in that, he uh, was reading a bunch of, you know, laboratory literature and found that if he did a cryogenic treatment, on stainless steel that he could actually get rid of all of the retained austenite, which is bad soft stuff. Let's just mm, call it okay. that so sure. it's easier. Yeah. Just bad soft stuff in stainless. And he did this, you know, there's, there's ways people say to do it, but he did it the correct way, which you quench in, in oil. So take it very, very hot and you cool it down very, very quickly. And then you wipe everything off and then you put it in a cryogenic treatment, which it was liquid nitrogen. And you hold it there for an hour or so. You pull it out and then you temper. And what this does is it takes all that bad soft stuff and turns it into good hard stuff, martensite. Mm -hmm. And then you can temper all of that down to whatever HRC you want. And you still are maintaining toughness. And you can get, you know, a harder um, knife. And these knives were called uh, frozen heat. So they did, if you go on uh, eBay right now, you can find a frozen heat ropes in for like 12 bucks and yeah. it's 440 C and it's probably one of the best knives you'll ever have. It is ground so goddamn thin. <laughs> and this is, this is in 1930, 1950 where these knives were ground so thin and they had optimal heat treat applied to them. And everyone is bitching about them. They're like, this knife is too hard to sharpen and all this other stuff. And then now we're on the opposite end of the playing field now. And, and we wouldn't have any of this. So we wouldn't People have at the time were complaining wasn't. about it. That's yeah, funny. yeah. And we wouldn't have any of this if it wasn't for, you know, Emerson Case just researching and, and trying to innovate and all yeah. that stuff. And that happened right in my backyard. And it's awesome. That is cool. Well, yeah, you're, you're, you're going to. So. I see you sitting in your knife making uh, studio slash uh, shop. Um, tell me about your operation and I, do you have a day job? What's how does knife making fit into your life as a as a man? Yeah, so currently I I mean I didn't see it feasibly you know fi or financially uh, responsible to quit my day job, but mm -hmm. um, I used to be a cartographer and make digital maps. Wow. And uh, now I am a licensed home inspector in New York State. So I do that okay. during the day. And then um, I do knife making from like uh, whenever my kid goes to bed at like seven o'clock till 12 in the morning. And I make knives. And um, I basically am 100% into the uh, lean manufacturing slash Kaizen process. No waste and Kaizen. kind of, yeah, Kaizen. Not Kaizen. Kaizen in Japanese means cook the books. You don't want to do oh. <laughs> No, no, not that. Uh, Kaizen, Kaizen is just, uh, it's what Toyota does. But back in the 40s, they did it. It's basically you're, you're taking your, uh, your lean manufacturing. You're taking all the waste out of your process and you're just getting down to bare bones. And that's how you, how you do production. Okay. So how does that production method um, uh, manifest itself in the knives you make? So it, so basically is like, I didn't want to just make one knife and just give it to somebody and just having, and I think a lot of makers, the way, the thing that trips them up is that they're like, oh yeah, I'll make you a custom. Okay, you want this color handle or you want this handle material and, excuse me, you want this type of steel. That's fine. But I think that's where a lot of makers downfall is, as far as fixed blades, I mean, I don't know about folder, you know, making yet, but, um, the way, I, the way I thought about doing it is like, why don't I just make a batch of knives and then say, hey, these are done. Who wants to buy one? And 
I did that with uh, K390 uh, batch, you know, a few months ago. And I made 12 at a time, or I made 12 in that batch. I did all of the, um, all of the grinding out of the, um, of the shape. And all the heat treating was done here in my shop. And all of the final grinds and all of the handles were all done here. Um, along the way, I've changed up my process. So I get things cut out, laser cut out. Mm-hmm. So that shaves like a week off of my... All the silhouetting time. and all that crap. Like just cutting out the shape. Yep. Yeah. Yep. All that stuff. That cuts out my lead time. Um, handles are going to be there in a second. I'm going to invest in some sort of CNC router to get the handles cut out. And after that, it's going to be all heat treating and grinding by hand in house, which is, which is mainly what is, is going into the performance of these. I already picked the handle material as uh, tarot tough. It's USA made, um, non-toxic material. It's very, what? very strong. It's stronger than my car actually. What? Yeah. What? How do you get stronger yeah. than my? No, but what? What is it? Uh, what? How is it composed? So it's just a sheet, and it's laid out just like my Carta, mm-hmm. but they use polyester binder or polyester epoxy, I guess, mm-hmm. with a polyester uh, cloth, and they press it all together, and it's non-toxic, and it's nice. very, very strong. I mean, I can't bend this, but. Right. Um, right. If you had a small piece of it and you went to bend it, it would just bend straight in half and not break. Oh, wow. It's, uh, and I think it's, um, you know, it's water resistant, all that stuff. So, so the whole concept of making a batch makes a lot of sense to me. Um, it, it seems like if, if you're gonna, if you, it's the best way to perfect one design because you have a, an opportunity to grind this knife over and over and and uh, presumably the last one you do will be better than the first one but still you you're working with the same product each time so that you're grinding it the same way uh, what other benefits do you get out of batches and how big are they so the bat the benefit of batches also um if somebody was like hey i want to buy one of your knives i'm like yeah i have i have 20 of them to sell right now so you can have one and I think that's one of the one of the concepts that I wanted to to kind of bring to the table is like there's a lot of people that are waiting years to buy a knife, mm, and that's mm-hmm. not that's not fair. Um, yeah, I understand that there's a lot of folders out there that are you know they take a long time. That's fine. There's a lot of fixed blades that people are waiting a year for. Like that's crazy to me. So I was yeah. like, why don't I just why don't I just use not use glue. I'll use hardware. I'll use tarot tough and I'll just really streamline everything and offer people knives immediately. Not so much like, go ahead. No, I was going to say, so right now during this process, what is the most cumbersome part? Is it the, is it the handles? Is that why you're seeking a CNC solution to kind of cutting out the handles and getting them ready? Yeah, I think right now that's the most cumbersome part is just, um, so on this, I just, I have everything laid out in a grid pattern and then I just lay everything out. So I have the most efficient, you know, you get the most, yeah, yeah, pretty much. And I'm buying everything in bulk. So then I can cut my costs there because I'm buying everything in bulk. So I cut everything out and then just fit everything to the handle. But the one thing that actually helped all of that process was getting everything laser, laser cut. Because now everything's standardized. And now I only have to make right. handles to standardize this. And, I mean, it seems a little bit, like, hokey and cheating. And, oh, you're not really a knife maker. You're using, you know, machines and all this. It's just That's like, bullshit. But, I mean, if, if but, anyone tells you that, you're like, who right, else is right. making it? Right, exactly. And I've, and I've heard some people say, like, well, I'm going to, you know, you know, maintain the craft and do everything by hand. And, like, that's fine. You're going to sell about six knives in a year. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. and if that's something you want to do, then you need to rely on machines and, and stuff like that. Like, I'm not going to machine grind, probably not for a long time. But I mean, if we look at like awesome makers like Andrew Demko, like he has a custom line and he has, you know, his machine ground line. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. So, when you were talking about uh, Kaizen, the concept of Kaizen, uh, it reminded me of something you mentioned uh, where you were talking about regrinds and, and, when you do a regrind for someone, you want it to be affordable and timely. You don't mm-hmm. want them to wait five months 
for a very mm -hmm. expensive regrind where they could have just gotten an entirely new knife. Um, yeah. How how does that concept that uh, work its way into your knife making? Is it that what you were talking about right now, streamlining the whole production process? Yeah, pretty much. Like I'll you know I'll use this file guide on it. Um, you know, first in, first out sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, wherever I am in my process, I'll just fit that regrind in, regrind it, and it's done. I mean, why? Like, I don't need to set time aside. I don't need to light candles and all that shit to <laughs> regrind. Yeah, I can just regrind a knife. And right. um, and the affordability part. I mean, <laughs> there we go. And the affordability part. I mean, it's it's flat rate, fifty bucks. Uh, I'll regrind it for fifty dollars and ship it back to you insured. So I'm not. I figured out the cost. I'm not losing any money on anything. So, yeah. Uh, so Alex, it seems like you have a pretty decent mind for business. Is this something that you came into knife making with, or is this something that you've uh, uh, through attrition have acquired? I think through attrition I've acquired um, over the years, you know, in college I worked in retail and, you know, when I got a big boy job, I worked the corporate life and all that stuff. And, um, I've always wanted to run my own business. I just didn't know what I wanted to do. Hmm. And I also, you know, came from an art background. I was a visual, a visual, um, communications major. So, um, advertising, all that stuff. And, okay. um, I never knew what route I wanted to go with it. And, and I think this is, this is my art, whether, whether it be design or, you know, grinding or heat treating, mm -hmm. there's an art to all of it. And yes. I think that this is something that it really spoke to me. Um, but I also wanted to offer people the chance to have something like this, like the everyday working guy. There's a lot of knives where you have to take out a loan to buy the knife. And it's, that's cra and that And that's fine. And I, I'll never understand that part of knife collecting. <laughs> and I blame, and I, every day I blame, um, I blame Bob Loveless for that. Ah, uh, yes, um, yes. But I love Bob Loveless. Um, so that whole story. But anyway, um, I just want people to be able to afford it. And that's what I'm offering is it's an affordable, high performance knife that anyone can buy. If anything, I'm just going to step up my batches and make more. That's, and the yeah. price is not going to change. Cool. Well, uh, you you started out your statement by saying that's crazy, like as if to say crazy, and then you said that's fine. <laughs> I like the way you <laughs> you you changed uh, tack there. In terms of marketing, like, so you have a corporate background, you have a, a background in market marketing artwork, basically. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, s from what you've learned so far in your, if if you don't mind me calling it, fledgling knife career, you know, because you've only yeah. been doing this a couple of years, right? What yeah, what exactly. kind of what kind of um, advice would you give others who, who might be not quite up to where you are in terms of getting themselves out there, marketing? I mean, I'm sure you could give them a whole scat of, uh, uh, of uh, technical advice, but what about the marketing kind of like getting yourself out there kind of advice? The marketing, I mean, honestly, the best way to market is word of mouth. That's the best way to market. If you can find somebody that's going to take a chance and buy a knife from you, sell mm -hmm. it to them immediately. Don't don't think anything about like, oh, this sucks. I can't, they don't deserve it. Just right. sell it to them and see what happens. And then just feedback and criticism. Just take it, just take it right on the chin and just let that be your driving force as far as, as moving forward. And um, I mean, we have social media, we have Facebook, we have mm -hmm. all these things and you can get into conversations with that people are having, comment on people's posts, um, ask questions, um, all that stuff. It's just, It'll make you better at marketing. That's all marketing is. You're just trying to sell yourself is what you're doing. Well, the thing the thing that resonates the most with me as a former art student is the criticism part. Take the criticism. And, you know, some people can be jerks about how they criticize, but tr try and distill out what the actual message is and try and try right. and detach and figure out how it can make your work better. And, you know, right. that's 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 a gift if you can look at it that mm -hmm. way and not be defensive about it. Um, so mm -hmm. what, okay. The sharks there, it's a limit. They're limited runs, limited batches. How, how do people get these yep. and what do they, what do they run? I mean, what are you charging for these? All right. So basically what happens is I'll get, I'll decide in my brain, what steel, what kind of crazy steel I want to do. And then I'll buy the biggest sheet that the company has that I can possibly okay. buy. 
Matt. And then we'll get them cut out. And then what I'll do is I'll announce them on Instagram. Um, I'm trying to find a different format, but right now on Instagram, if you just follow me and you just, great. you know, ask me, I'll, I'll have it up there. Um, as far as price, it all depends on the steel, really. Mm-hmm. I don't charge any extra for um, handle material because it's all standardized. It's all the same price. Um, it's mostly steel. So let's go. All right. So the 4V, these ran about 180 bucks. Oh, that's and sweet. this is what you get. You get the, the full knife, the tarot tough handles, the hardware, and the sheath with the ulti clip. Sweet. And um, crew wear was the same price. The K390 was a little bit more. It was about 250 And the LC200N, which I have right here, is going to run about 185 hmm. And then the last batch of the year, I'm not going to announce, but that's going to be, you know, low 200, low 200 to 190 area. This is a new model that you're coming out with? Nope, nope, same model. It's just different oh, steel. A different steel that run, you're not going to talk yeah. about. Okay. Yeah, I run different uh, steels in this batch. Or this okay, design, so, rather. so as you, uh, you know, you're, you're, I mean, you were talking about word of mouth before. That's how I learned about you from some trusted mm-hmm. sources. And so mm-hmm. as you move forward, you know, and you've got the shark now. Eventually, you'll 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 widen your product uh, base and such. Uh, what what are your ultimate goals with uh, Steingraber um, performance knives? Do you want to be a giant company? You want to stay boutique? What what are you looking to do? Nope, giant company. I want to I want to really just get out there and you know be cold steel esque, if you will. That man has so much goddamn fun cutting stuff. Oh, dude. <laughs> That's what I want to do. But um, yeah, I mean, uh, big, big time plans. I mean, I have my DBA now, so I'm a full fledged business. Um, and I ran it under uh, SPK Unlimited. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not limited to what I want to do. Hmm. Uh, trying to acquire another uh, heat treat oven. So I'll have two heat treat ovens and I want to heat treat uh, blades for people that can't really afford uh, Peter's prices or lead Ooh, times. That's- um, and um, eventually, uh, so the guy that runs lasers on my all my uh, knives, uh, Monroe Laser here in here in town, I want him and I are going to buy a giant laser uh, fiber gantry to cut steel out, um, and get these things really ramped up. Um, and then we're talking, you know, more sharks, more sasquatches, maybe a, a camp hatchet down the road with a different mm. steel, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The sky's the limit if you're if you're looking yeah. at it that way, and that's how you should be looking. Now, here's my question: You bring yeah. in uh, Cold Steel as a, as an example. I'm a huge fan. Uh, have been since 1980, whatever you know, since I was a little boy. Love me some Cold yeah. Steel. So, do you plan? Would you want to keep it all domestic? I know, I know. I'm getting way ahead of you. Uh, who knows <laughs> what you're gonna want to do? But I mean, like, ideally speaking. I mean, ideally speaking, I would want to make everything myself um, because then I have full control over everything. I have full control over the heat treat. I have full control over the process. Um, You know, if I design things that are with, you know, basic materials, then I think I can accomplish that. I don't need to get super crazy with things. Um, There's definitely, I'm definitely want to do a folder in in the future, um, a lockback design. I don't want to do a, a, you know, a liner lock or anything like that, just a lockback. I'm a huge fan of lockbacks, so yeah, yeah. Um, I think a lockback in K390 with my Carta scales would be just so choice, and yeah. um, that's those are the plans. I mean, I think another word of advice to all these knife makers that are starting out is just keep your head high and just fucking go for it, man. Just just do wow. it. We're a very finite time on this earth, and you need to just do it, regardless yeah, of money or anything like that. Just figure it out. I agree with you, especially if you have a passion for something as particular and, you know, uh, microscopic as knives. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. like if if you're that interested in knives, man, you should probably make it make it make a play for it. Um, yeah. I, too, am a big fan of backlocks. Would you ever consider um, trying to I don't know, even know if they would do this, but license the triad lock? I actually I actually thought about that because. Here's another thing too, is like, I don't know if you know this about me. I don't know anything about CAD, nothing. Um, the reason why I got this, this 
right here is I reached out to people in the community and they helped me. Mm -hmm. So that's how awesome this community is. Some dude was like, yeah, man, I do this as a daily job. I'll throw that in CAD for you. He did. And awesome. now I have my design in there. I obviously I hooked him up um, and took care of him. But I mean, yeah, I would absolutely love to license the triad lock. I think it's a great lock. Um, yeah. I don't know how much it would cost. I obviously have to reach out to, you know, the certain people and stuff like that. But that's definitely something that I would definitely consider. I like I like the idea of making a back lock. So many people are are so locked into the the frame lock, uh, mm -hmm. the titanium frame lock thing. But uh, in speaking with uh, um, Matt Martin of Vehement Knives, you know he was talking about making a a a folder eventually, and he's got back lock designs. I'm like, oh, that that makes sense. He makes these sort of um, sort of old fashioned -y fixed blades. It makes sense to do a kind of an older school lock. Mm -hmm. I really like it. It's not an exhausted thing, you know, just mm -hmm. because design has moved on or just because new steels have been created doesn't mean that 440C doesn't cut anymore or the back lock right. doesn't keep the knife open anymore. Exactly. And it's one of the most strongest locks, honestly, like you're not going to get a failure on a back lock. Um, yeah. You do a whack test or whatever, it's not going to fail. Um, and that's something that, again, with the performance in my, in my name, I want, I want it to perform. I want it to not fail on people. So how do people get in touch with you and, and well, ultimately buy one of your knives? How, how does that work? Um, if you want to buy a knife, just follow me on Instagram and look at, you know, wait for me to announce the steel. I don't have all the knives made when I announce the steel. I do mm -hmm. have them all cut out, though. And then what I do is I, uh, and if you want to buy one, you just slide in my DMs and DM me. I know it's very archaic, but that's the way I have to do it right now. Um, and then if it, if the spots fill up, then I'll still take your name down. There are people that will drop out or do drop out. It's fine. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole reason why I made the, that's the whole reason why I did this. I don't ask for money up front. And that's the reason why I did that is because people have lives. Shit happens and they, if they can't afford it, they can't afford it. It's no, yeah. there's no shame. Um, yeah. but there's going to be a person that wants to buy that knife too. So give them the opportunity, you know, that's, that's the way it should be done. I agree with that because yeah, you're right. You might, you might be high on the hog and so excited to uh, put it in order for a knife. Three months go by, things change. You got to drop yeah. out. So yeah, yeah. and have some people yeah. in the wings that you can sell that to. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Alex Steingraber of Steingraber Performance Knives, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Uh, thanks for coming on the Knife Junkie Podcast, sir. I appreciate. Hey, it. man, it's been a pleasure. All right, man. So uh, we will chat soon. And uh, everybody keep an eye out for the shark uh, and go to Instagram, check him out. And also on YouTube, not only for uh, talk about his knives, but also testing of other knives and uh, your opinions on knives and grinds. And it's a mm -hmm. pretty valuable tool. So check him out there. Absolutely. All Got right. Thank question you. or comment? Call the Knife Junkies listener line at 724-466-4487. All right, Bob, we're back on the uh, Knife Chunky podcast, episode number 146. And I must admit, I uh, have learned something. All the, the uh, talk about behind the edge and geometry, <laughs> which, yeah. you know, I barely got through high school with geometry and chemistry and all that. Uh, it, it made sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, if, if this is your blade and then, and this is your edge and you just make it thinner. It's going to cut. It's going to slice through things quicker. It's yeah. weird, but uh, sometimes you just need a, a little uh, elaboration to make it make sense. <laughs> right, right. Help me out there. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and he did. He did. All right. Final thoughts as we uh, wrap it up. Anything uh, Anything you want to leave us with? I'm, I'm impressed by uh, how Alex is a man with a plan. He seems to, he seems to yeah. know uh, how he wants to progress in his business, but also like the smartest way to not be caught with extra materials, to not be caught with a bunch of knives he has to sell, uh, but to kind of keep rolling and, and, and also serve his own interests in, mm. in figuring out what steels he wants to try next. And, and it looks like, I, I like the idea of limiting, uh, the models at first to, you know, one model or two models that you, that you have really dialed in and then you change the steels and uh, reputation grows. I mean, he's grinding them super thin and that's what people want. So, uh, you know, I, I think he's got it. Uh, he's, he's, he's well on his way. Right. Well, and I, I uh, particularly like the uh, 
what 50 buck flat rate uh, regrind. I mean, oh I yeah, yeah, yeah. I got, I got, I got a whole. Yeah, I think it's going to be a big market there for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, you know, we, I think, I think regrinds are probably at this point second on the tier of uh, you know yeah. because yeah, you know, but still, yeah. you learn a lot from taking someone else's slop and turning it into a fine, fine blade. So anyway, All right. yeah. All right. Well, Alex, thank you, buddy, for uh, being on the Knife Junkie podcast, episode number 146. More interviews, of course, coming every Sunday. And then our midweek show, which uh, gives Bob a chance to talk about his knives and other knives in the news. And then, of course, don't forget uh, Thursday nights. It's our live video show, Thursday Night Knives at uh, 10 p.m. Eastern on YouTube and Facebook. So hope you'll uh, join us three times a week for uh, more Knife Junkie talk. All right, so for Mr. Knife Junkie himself, Bob DeMarco, I'm Jim, the Knife Newbie over here, saying thank you so much for joining us on this episode of the Knife Junkie thank Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Point, point.